So this is a joint work with Leonard Tabelo in Bielefeld in the context of such a small collaborative research <coughs> unit which we have recently established. So I, I summarize the setup and the main questions we are addressing here very briefly. We have 35 minutes. So we consider an isolated quantum many body system of this perturbative structure. You have a, an unperturbed reference system and a sufficiently weak perturbation, where I will specify what this means in a minute, what sufficiently weak should mean. And then the question we address, given I know how the unperturbed system relaxes as a function of time, how does this relaxation behavior change in response to this perturbation here? That's the question. The first remark is, of course, you can't treat this by the time-independent perturbation theory, but you really readily notice you have small energy difference here. It's a many-body system. The energy differences are exponentially small in the degrees of freedom. So with this theory, you can only treat ridiculously weak perturbations, which do not lead to any notable uh, change in the relaxation. But that will certainly not work. We have to do this in a different way. These are typical examples we may have in mind. Unperturbed are two isolated subsystems, each isolated from the other in itself. And then you, you turn on a weak interaction. And for instance, you look at the energy difference between the two systems. The unperturbed is always the dashed or dashed slotted line. The unperturbed behavior will be a trivial constant. That is a typical example, a constant of motion in the unperturbed system. Now you, put, you, you would switch on the interaction and then if they are equal, these two systems, it will go to zero in some way, you would expect. Or the unperturbed system is an integrable one. So some observable would relax from an initial non-equilibrium value towards some steady state equilibrium, equilibrium but not thermal long time limit. And then you switch on a perturbation which breaks the integrability. So for weak perturbation, you would expect it follows the unperturbed behavior for quite some time. But ultimately, please note this is logarithmic, ultimately it is bound to go to the two term uh, long time limit. And so this plateau or the whole behavior as a, as a whole is usually called pre-thermalization. That's also a typical example we have in mind. Or more generally, whatever you have, you have a known system which you can't treat somehow, and now you perturb it to some extent within some limits. For instance, the unperturbed is always the dashed one. It would behave like this, and you know how it behaves, and now you switch on the perturbation, and how does it change? So, in more detail, the setup, we have this perturbed Hamiltonian and, and some observable, which is a self-adjoint operator, and an initial state, rho zero, which may be pure or mixed, and usually is far from equilibrium. The time evolution of this state is governed, as usual, by the propagator corresponding to this time-independent Hamiltonian, and here it's a joint on the other side. That's how a rho evolves in time exactly. And then the time-dependent expectation value will be abbreviated by this symbol, expectation value, and it is given by the trace of the state at time t and the observable. That will give you the relaxation behavior or the time dependent, whatever it is, behavior of the system. And likewise, the unperturbed dynamics will 
for the unperturbed dynamic theory, we'll get this unperturbed expectation values. Uh, the unperturbed system state stays in the same state as before, but then propagates according to the unperturbed Hamiltonian. Now the question is, given I know how this thing behaves, can I predict how the perturbed relaxation of this observable behaves? That is the question and the setup. Now, the main assumption is, as usual in this, sorry, that is the initial state. No, it's an initial state. It is a state in the Hilbert space, whatever age is. That's not, then this will be evolved either by H or by H0. Uh, as usual, I consider that there is a window for a relatively small window of significantly populated energy levels. Here is the energy axis. Here are the energy eigenvalues uh, sketched. And please note the density usually increases with increasing energy. It is very dense, but it gets even much more denser as E increases. Uh, and I, it is usually assumed, and I, we assume this as well, this is microscopically large, and the microscopic scale this interval is large. It contains very many levels. And on the macroscopic scale, it is small, which means the energy is, macroscopically speaking, well-defined. The system energy is well-defined. Mm. And even the, the, the interval is even so small that the level density is approximately constant throughout this interval. Globally, it increases, but the interval is so small that the density is approximately constant in, in my considered interval. And now I can tell you the perturbation is so weak that the level density in my interval does not change notably under this perturbation. As I said, the level density and the gradient of the level density determines the thermodynamics of the system. If it were in equilibrium, the system would exhibit some thermodynamic properties. And I assume the, the perturbation do not notably change the thermodynamic properties of the system so the, the perturbation does not lead to a phase transition. That would be an extreme counterexample, which is not covered, and it does not notably change the heat capacity or whatever. That's the meaning of weak. It does not change the thermodynamic properties of the system if it were at equilibrium. In this sense, V is considered as a weak perturbation. Now, for any, if, you, if I give you H0 and the perturbation V, it is, in my opinion, impossible to treat this problem analytically in, in, in some way, exactly, or in some controlled approximation. So you have to do some thing. And what we do is to go and invoke the so-called random matrix approach. That's our way solve this otherwise probably unsolvable question. It must, as I said, you cannot apply ordinary perturbation theory that we would not give meaningful results. Uh, so the approach must be, by definition, non-perturbative. So the idea is, instead of one particular perturbation, we consider a whole class of somehow similar perturbations, which are resembling the true one. And we call this an ensemble, a whole set, an ensemble of different similar perturbations in some sense. So I should specify immediately what I mean with similar. So that is the perturbed Hamiltonian, which I now write down in a matrix form in the basis of the unperturbed eigenstates. So, of course, the unperturbed Hamiltonian is diagonal in the unperturbed basis. 
And these are the unperturbed matrix elements of the perturbation. Of the perturbation yeah. And now, this thing, which I abbreviate in this matrix notation, uh, becomes a random matrix. I have a whole set of such matrices, VMN, which they are all randomly somehow generated, but most of them look, in some reasonable sense, similar to the true perturbation, which is not random, but which I want to emulate or imitate by a whole ensemble. So some key feature should, should well reproduce the true non-random perturbation. For instance, please note, if I would simply approximate this uh, perturbed Hamiltonian as a generalized orthogonal or unitary ensemble, this would be completely unacceptable because it has not the, the, the true properties which you would expect from such a perturbed Hamiltonian. Such a GOE or GOE can certainly not be used here. So, what we assume instead uh, is we have a random ensemble of such uh, matrices. We assume the average is zero. That, please note that this, the, this is the symbol for averaging over the ensembles of matrices phi, these square brackets with the index V. So on the average over the ensemble, the entries are zero. Second moment, or the variance, is given by some function of the distance from the diagonal, m minus n is the distance from the diagonal. And this is a, must be a reasonably slowly varying function of its arguments. It can include sparsity or boundedness. And, uh, and for the rest, of course, it's a Hermitian matrix, but otherwise the entries are independent. So this would be this matrix. Now the diagonal elements are special. There you have a right variety of possible modifications, but without loss of generality, you can make them uh, on the average zero by adding some constant. And then you have off diagonals, and uh, they can, for instance, be sparse. So, say with probability 90%, it is zero. And the remaining 10% are distributed according to some whatever distribution with some second moment f. That's, that so would. No, f, uh, the distribution, say, distribution of, uh, it can have a delta peak at zero, and then you have with a certain finite probability the value zero. Yes, that's the variance. Yeah, I mean, you can have, at, even, at every distance from the diagonal, a different sparsity, if you like. But the second moment is given by f. It, it can change from, from, from uh, row to row. It is relatively general. Especially, the second moment can decrease as a, as a function of the distance from the diagonal. And this is called the banded matrix. It may be banded or it may not, whatever. No, not really. I mean, it should be not too crazy. Usually, you assume it is slowly varying as a function of its argument. It's, it should decrease or, or stay constant, not, not increase. I think it should not increase. Sorry? It can be constant, if you like. It can be sparse and banded or whatever. And I think one can generalize this. You can, for the diagonals, you can generalize a lot. You have no much more freedom. You can prove this. But I think you can also generalize this independence and so on. Essentially, it's a central limit theorem at the background. 
only your second moments at the end really count. But it's very much more difficult to prove, of course, than, the, than generalizations of the, cent, of the central limit theorem itself. But in principle, I think it works in the same way. So, in spirit, all this is similar to the original work by Eugene Wigner. Initially, he considered this kind of random matrices. Only later, he switched to the much more simpler BOE and GUE. And Josh Deutsch, in this groundbreaking paper, essentially considered the exactly the same situation, but he focused on the long time limit. And I generalized this essentially to all times, including the relaxation before the long time limit is reached. And the matrix, the random matrix approach is similar, but substantially generalizes this one here. So I could tell stories, but I have no time about these people, which I happen to know. <coughs> so now the perturbation is randomized, not the unperturbed, but the perturbation is randomized. So H is now also a random matrix of a special structure. And therefore, the perturbed evolution is also randomized. And therefore, also the expectation values are randomized via the randomness of the perturbation. So the three main steps will be evaluate the ensemble average of these random expectation values over the ensemble. That's the first step. But then you have, that's usually where random matrix people stop. But that is not good enough, I think. What does it mean, this average? You have to consider the deviation of the average. It's also a random quantity now, xi. Square it and take the average of the square. That quantifies the typical deviation from the average, and you have to show that this is small. Then you can say the, the overwhelming majorities of these random matrices produce uh, expectations values very close to the average. The typical Vs produce or behave like the, very similar to the average. That is the final step. And that is the usual ph philosophy behind random matrix theory. And now you have to argue that the true one, the true V, is one of those which belong to the large majority and not one of those which belong to the very small minority. And this is non-systematic. You cannot prove this. This is a non-systematic step in this approach, similar to other very successful non-systematic approaches like using the quantum Boltzmann equation beyond the, the, the validity limits of its original derivation, for instance, is a very successful approach and others. But it's non-systematic. I cannot tell you the error which I make and I cannot tell, give you the next order improvement. All this is impossible. It's a non-systematic argument which you can believe or not. Now, how is it done? I have only limited time. What did you really do is an, a usual question by many colleagues. What did you really calculate? So it is this. That's the expectation value, the time propagated state, and A. I expanded in the basis of the perturbed Hamiltonian. So immediately get this matrix representation of the trace. I don't give you the details, I have no time. This would be the, matrix, the transformation from the unperturbed basis with index zero to the perturbed one. So the perturbed basis vectors can be written in terms of the unperturbed and the transformation. These are the perturbed matrix elements and similarly for A. Now you introduce, you replace all these perturbed matrix elements by unperturbed ones. Each time you get the sum, so you get here double sum and two u's, and now you get the unperturbed matrix elements, and likewise for A, you get two u's and two sums over two extra indices. Uh, and then I collect everything. Here you have a six-fold sum over all indices. You have now the unperturbed matrix elements, which are fixed. They are non-random quantities now. 
These are the transformation matrices. Now this thing is not nice for the moment, but I can replace it by the unperturbed eigenvalues by exploiting the assumption that, this, that the level density is not notably changed by the perturbation. Yeah, I can give you a rigorous bound, which, which shows that this is a very good approximation. I, get, I have a rigorous bound. <laughs> It really works. I mean, this is not a, it's, it's not a critical step here. So the only random things which remain are these <coughs> matrix transformations. This is fixed, but these new matrix, these new eigenvectors are random because the perturbation is random. This is the, rand the random objects and everything else is non-random. So I want to calculate the average. I have to average over four such U matrix elements. Later, I will also want to calculate the variance. This will involve eight of them in the same way. And the computation is done, the evaluation of these uh, averages is done by means of supersymmetry methods. This is, of course, the main work, this one line. It is more than one. Uh, one man year work of my very good student and myself is in this line. <coughs> and it turns out an important the key role is played by the second moment, which I call little u. It only depends on the difference of the indices. And it's Fourier transform, which I call g. That's the Fourier transform of this u. They play the central role in this game, that turned out. So these are the main results for the average dynamics. So it looks like this. I will go through each term now. A bar is the long time average. That it turns out that is the that is the value of this ensemble average in the long time limit. And this is exactly the same thing which Deutsch obtained because he considered the long time limit problem of the same situation. And he has already argued convincingly, this is essentially the thermal value in the long time limit, thermal expectation value. That is the unperturbed dynamics, which is assumed to be given. That is the Fourier transform of the second moment, uh, absolute squared here, which appears. And there is a rest, a complicated rest term, which I don't write down, but you can show it is zero for time equals zero, the rest is zero for large times. And it is very close to zero, or it is zero, if these two matrix elements are independent random numbers. And for instance, if ETH holds, then these are practically constant. <laughs> So they are independent, and then R is zero for all T. But ETH is sufficient, but not necessary, in order that this R is negligible. But we think it is good reason to say this R is negligible for practically all purposes. Now, for sufficiently small lambda, you can evaluate this U. This was the part of this main work. Uh, you can evaluate, and also it's Fourier transform, it turns out it, it will give rise to an exponential decay. It's a rate which is proportional to the perturbation strength square and the coefficient, which is essentially the variance of the matrix elements, not too far from the diagonal, if in case it is bounded, divided by the level spacing that is entering the coefficient alpha. For larger lambdas, you will get a different, a different uh, here temporal factor, which you also can calculate for, for larger alpha in case you have a bounded structure. If you have no bound, then this is valid for any lambda. <coughs> but for bounded, you get more complicated cheese for larger perturbations. So if I, if I, uh, if I take all these things into account, I obtain the simplified conclusion. This is the thermal value. This is the exponential time dependence. 
this is the term value and the rest is neglected. It's an approximation. Now the variance is even more is even more involved to evaluate what you get for the variance. It's the operator norm of your observable times an exponentially small number in the degrees of freedom of the system. So this is a ridiculously small number. So this means this second moment is practically almost zero. So the variance is extremely small. So the spread in this random ensemble of Vs is very small around the mean behavior. So we conclude for the vast majority of within this ensemble of perturbations, uh, the true behavior is very close to the average behavior. That would be the main result. So it tells you the perturbed dynamics resembles the unperturbed dynamics that is modulated by such an exponential decay towards the long time limit of the perturbed dynamics. And this uh, decay rate scales quadratically in the <coughs> perturbation strengths. I have, I am very well in time. So here is the first, I mean, as I said, it's a non-systematic approximation. You cannot prove it rigorously. So finally, you have to recurse to comparison with examples. Here are some state-of-the-art numerical results from the literature. We are not numerical people. So we take what other people have already found and try uh, to test. Uh, here, sorry, that was too far. That is the bose hubbard model with such a coupling J, which is set to one in these previous uh, publications, creation and annihilation operators as usual. And here, the repulsive U, that's the usual Hubbard model. And now, you could consider this as the perturbation strength lambda, but it turns out that's not good. For those results, all the U's were already too large. They are beyond the validity limit of our perturbation. But we can map the weak perturbation to a strong perturbation by this ingenious paper, which we fortunately discovered. So you can map exactly this problem uh, with the initial, the initial state is the odd states are empty and the even states are singly occupied. For this initial state and this model, you can map it exactly in the limit u goes to infinity. This is exact. An effective spin one half chain where this part is an xx spin one half model and this perturbation involves next nearest, nearest and next nearest neighbor interaction on, the, on two and three spin terms. It's a complicated animal, whatever. Uh, but anyway, this is exact in the limit u goes to infinity. And so one over u is now, this is now our effective h zero and that is our effective perturbation parameter. Fortunately, the theory does not really you don't need to know the details of, of all these things. In this sense, it is uh, somehow universal. So here is the analytical known behavior of the outside population starting at zero. And this is an analytical solution of the unperturbed situation here. Uh, and this, if you include perturbation, uh, analytical solution is impossible. It's a state of the art GM, uh, DMGR simulations in the group of Uli Scholbeck and collaborators. These are the dashed lines for different values of lambda. Lambda is one divided by u. That is the outside population, and that is the nearest neighbor correlation, in some, roughly speaking. So that's are the results numerically, uh, and now you can. Compare with our theory, which looks like this. Uh, in principle, this quantity alpha, which involves the variation of the close to diagonal matrix elements and the level spacing, in principle, they should be available, but you cannot find it in this paper, and we cannot do the numerics again. So this must be a fit parameter. 
principally this can be known, but in this case we don't know it. So it is a fit parameter, and we fitted it, and that's the only fit parameter, which, which leads to the solid lines here. This is our result. This, ah, mm. Here. Yeah, it's, it's the perturbation strength, the variance of the matrix elements divided by the level spacing, and the 2 pi, in addition to 2 pi. Hmm? And on the level spacing, on the level Right, but V is expressed in the basis of H0. <laughs> it is computable, but we could not find the values in this published work. They happen not to tell us the values. <laughs> because they were not interested in these things. They were not interested in this random matrix. They did the DMGR simulation here. Maybe they could not even give it to me in a, with the DMGR approach. But in principle, it would be computable, but in practice, it is not available to us. That is the corresponding experiment in the group of Immanuel Bloch. It's called atoms in a one-dimensional optical superlattice with 30 rubidium atoms, which are strongly repelling each other. It is supposed to imitate this model very well. Again, it's the same thing, the, the, the analytically exact results, the dots are the experimental results, and the solid lines are our analytics using the same fit parameter. So in principle, this is without a fit parameter. Uh, and you see, here is a, for small perturbations, it deviates. But even if you would compare it with the, with the exact numerics, it would exhibit the same deviation. So that means probably that for small lambda, which means large u, uh, this model will probably not capture all experimentally relevant details. That is, that is most likely the reason for the deviation for small lambda. Here is another example, the Eisenberg XXT chain, or the XXT uh, one spin one half model, with anisotropy parameter lambda. Lambda is now, the anisotropy is now the perturbation. And this is the staggered magnetization. The system is initialized in a nail state. Uh, again, dashed is analytically, ex ah, I, I said something important not. All this, each time this line is shifted by minus one quarter in order that you better can see it. It's a very bad mistake. Each subsequent line, we shifted the lines by one quarter, otherwise you have a mess of lines. In all these plots, we shifted it in this way. And here again, this, the dashed is the true without the shift result, and then each line is shifted, and for an increasingly large perturbation, lambda. And uh, the solid is our theory, and the dashed is the very accurate numerical state-to-the-art result. This model exhibits for lambda smaller than one uh, a Luttinger liquid phase, and for lambda bigger than one a gapped anti-ferromagnetic phase. So at lambda equal one, you have a phase transition. There, at, at last, the perturbation must stop. But you see it works extremely well down to the critical point at lambda equal one. No, no, it's the same problem. We have one fit parameter because they could not tell us the two quantities which we need, not in the paper.
Ja, gamma, gamma is the decay rate. It is essentially 2 pi. And this would be the variance of the matrix elements relatively close to the diagonal. And this is the level spacing. And, and then you have a lambda square. And this is one number, which is once fitted, and then lambda square changes. You have different lambda values here. Only one, only one number. We don't know it. Yeah, yeah, it's always, in every plot, I have one single. Yeah, yeah, sure. Not each time a new alpha value. And this is uh, the results by Maria and two authors in the audience, namely Wojciech Teruk and Marcos Rigol. The Bose Harvard model with next nearest neighbor interactions of strings lambda. Again, I have one fit parameter. I can, Marcos told me it's in the paper, but it's not exactly that thing which we need. I can show you. It is, we, our fit parameter, I think, was 4.2, and in your paper, you got 3.8 numerically, but it's not exactly the same quantity. It's close. So this. With lambda equals zero, it's integrable. It does not thermalize, but equilibrate. And as lambda increases, you get pre-thermalization, goes to a different long time limit, namely the thermal value. The solid line is our theory, which nicely explains these findings. So I come to the summary. Yeah, it is over. We consider this perturbed relaxation problem. That's the main result. Essentially, it's governed by this Fourier transform, the second moments. For small perturbation, it is always of this form, where alpha is the variance, the V is divided by level spacing. For larger, uh, for larger lambda, in case you have a bounded structure, otherwise this is always valid. In case of a bounded structure, you have a more complicated formula, which we also can give you. Uh, and the data is are in this preprint, which is unfortunately still under review because it has a very long supplemental material covering this one year man work. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks, Peter, for a beautiful talk. W one thing that I really don't understand is how it's possible that there is a pure exponential form there. And let me tell you why I don't understand that. Because the intuition from Fermi Golden Rule says that that alpha times lambda square is, of course, what we call the Fermi Golden Rule uh, rate. But that Fermi Golden Rule rate, of course, depends on the state that you are in. And as your as as the conserved quantities of H zero as that changes slowly, right during relaxation, the Fermi Golden Rule rate should also change. I don't know whether it makes sense with them, but that's why I just cannot wrap my head around that. Uh, so your problem is oh, sorry, your problem is not that this is not smooth at zero. That is not your problem. Uh -huh. yeah. Lambda should change according to the Fermi Golden Rule. I don't know, that's what comes out. <laughs> well, you, you speak about, say, non banded, non banded. But if it is banded, of course, this is not anymore true. And you have something different, non-exponential, and uh, it's a Bessel function, a far banded uh, limit. But if it is non-banded, uh, that comes out. Maybe it is, maybe it is uh, somehow hidden in this in these corrections, but they are very small. I, I cannot tell you. 
Is it really a notable effect in your case? Yeah, but, but then it will be hidden in this, in the exact formula with the, with the correction. They are not exactly zero, unless the A and Ns are exactly N independent, right? Maybe they are hidden there. But it's, it's, all, it's a whole salad of formula without much physics. <laughs> The presence of the generacy in the Hamiltonian is important, so it's With the, In the unperturbed, you mean? Yeah. Oh, this does Would it be a problem? That's not really much of a no. Genesis, oh, I mean, if they are not extreme, I mean. You must, because, have, for example, you must in the have a reason that the thermodynamics of the unperturbed system. <coughs> if all energies are exactly equal, it has no reasonable thermodynamic. No, no, I'm not. No. But if you have a few degeneracies, this is not. No, I'm thinking, for example, in the model you show the XX in model. Levels are double degenerate. Oh, no. There are a very. It's not a problem. <laughs> 